Hi all, I'm Chris Potts. Welcome to our unit on swearing. Swearing is a wonderful way for us to round out this course. It will allow us to draw together many themes that we've seen throughout the quarter, and it's a topic that has rich societal and legal aspects to it. I'm hoping that I can show you that the concepts we've covered and the perspectives we've taken can genuinely illuminate the issue of swearing, and perhaps even help us move toward a more productive way of thinking about swearing as a concept in our society. For the entire unit, we're going to have the F word in the spotlight, since it's a strong swear that's often discussed and debated and legislated. But I think that what I say is relevant for other swears and also for swearing in other languages. And of course, various other swears will play supporting roles in our discussion, of course. In terms of the scope of our coverage, I'm going to try to take a really expansive view on swearing. We'll look at it from the perspective of semantics and pragmatics, of course. But I'm also going to bring in cognitive evidence, and of course our goal is to understand why swears have the special social power that they do. Throughout the discussion, we'll be thinking about the taboos that surround swears, and in particular the taboos surrounding the F word. And I do want to help you get a firmer grip on what that taboo is and where it comes from. But I should warn you at the outset that my goal, in a way, is to leave you feeling somewhat confused about all this, right? My goal is to confuse you about why swearing is taboo. That is, why swears have the power that they do. But indeed, I will say, right, the characterization I want to offer is that swears are, in effect, little explosive speech act packages with very complex perlocutionary effects on the people who hear them. When you swear, you do something in the world, and part of that is that you probably violate some social taboos, which always has social consequences, sometimes even profound ones. Why might this lead you to feel confused? Well, the arguments I give can easily trend toward a feeling of paradox. In a sense, I'm going to try to support the paradoxical conclusion that the conservative Parents Television Council should actually be advocating to remove all societal constraints on swearing. Why? Well, since swears have no intrinsic ability to harm, but rather only obtain that power from the way we treat them as a society, there's no better way to remove the harm they cause than to remove the taboos, and you would do that with continual use. And so, conversely, controversial comedians should be on the side of maintaining taboos surrounding swearing. After all, it's important that those taboos exist for them to remain powerful and in turn funny in those comedians' acts. Now, I'm not saying that this is the right conclusion. On the contrary, there is something amiss here, right? But the idea is that such a paradox can be useful and that it might reveal that we're unreflectively accepting some problematic assumptions. Okay, let's move now to the section called The Road to FCC versus Fox Television Stations. And I'm going to use this case as a kind of narrative frame for our discussion. So this is a U.S. Supreme Court case that turns on specific instances of the F word being aired on network television. So you can see right away that we're dealing with substantial topics for society since this went all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, and indeed it has done so in various ways numerous times throughout the ages. So let's check out this partial timeline I've constructed here to give you a sense for how we got to the present moment in the history of swearing. The first major event is the Radio Act of 1927. And it says, no person within the jurisdiction of the United States shall utter any obscene, indecent, or profane language by means of radio communication. This is a really important moment in the U.S. history when it comes to establishing that the government has the power to legislate speech on public airways, even if this might seem on the face of it to be a violation of people's First Amendment rights. The act itself was subsequently replaced by later legislation, in part to broaden it so that it could go beyond radio transmissions, but the essential ideas behind this certainly remain alive to this day. Then we'll skip ahead to 1975. You may have heard of comedian George Carlin's famous routine called Filthy Words. It's a sort of meditation on the words that you can't say on the public airwaves, and he even frames it that way, and he goes on to use a bunch of them repeatedly in amusing ways. The routine is from 1972, and it's actually pretty striking even today that he says all the words that he does say so freely. Even more striking is that in 1975, Pacifica Radio played the routine on the radio in the middle of the day. And this led to complaints from listeners, and the case that one of those listeners brought eventually made its way all the way to the Supreme Court in a case called Pacifica versus the FCC. 
The Supreme Court ultimately ruled in favor of the FCC, concluding that public broadcasting has only the most limited First Amendment protection. But from there, we have a kind of uneasy peace, I would say. From around 1975 to around 2004, the FCC was certainly actively monitoring the situation, but they would respond only if a broadcaster permitted sustained and deliberate use of prof profanity. And certain uses were permitted in news contexts or for clearly non-vulgar uses. And that seems like a pretty linguistically sensible and enlightened policy to me. But then, in the early 2000s, something changed. First, we had a run of celebrities swearing in live broadcasts. Cher, Bono, Nicole Richie, these were the big ones, but there were others as well. And these became known as fleeting expletives. And the new thing is really that these fleeting expletives were met with a boatload of complaints from viewers, probably the result uh, of an organized letter-writing campaign. In response to those campaigns, the FCC started sanctioning the fleeting expletives. So whereas previously they had allowed them, they were now cracking down, and they even codified this in new policies. In response, Fox took the FCC to court since Fox affiliates received a number of the fines. The Second Circuit Court sided with Fox, and then the case went to the Supreme Court in 2009 first. And the Supremes ultimately sided with the FCC, but they didn't really engage with the First Amendment issues. They instead focused on due process, on whether the rules were being applied consistently and fairly. And the First Amendment issues were remanded back to the Second Circuit Court, which again backed Fox. All of this led to a second Supreme Court case in 2012. This case was specifically about whether the FCC standards for indecency on television were too vague to be constitutional. Here, the Supreme Court sided with Fox and waived the fines, but they explicitly avoided the First Amendment issues yet again. Now, as far as I can tell, we're now living in this new era where things feel uncertain. In general, though, it seems like interest in the fleeting expletive on the public airwaves is falling. But the main change here is probably that the public airwaves are just less important to how people consume media. In addition, clearly, there are changes in the political and cultural landscape that really matter. For example, Fleeting Expletive has its own Wikipedia page that has a list of incidents, and one of them even reports on a 2013 incident in which the FCC chair tweeted his support of David Ortiz after Ortiz issued a fleeting expletive. And the chair actually said, David Ortiz spoke from the heart at today's Red Sox game. I stand with Big Poppy and the people of Boston. It's really impossible to imagine such a thing being said by the FCC chair in the era in which we saw those initial fleeting expletives being sanctioned. In any event, let me summarize all this. Running through this entire timeline with all its heavyweight court cases, we have a consistent theme. In the US, if you want to regulate some language, you have to show that it's obscene, indecent, or profane, just as it's given in the founding legislation, the Radio Act. And in the US, obscene, indecent, or profane means sex. And you can see that the FCC is playing this game in what is really the central hypothesis of the memorandum it issued in 2004 as part of changing the standards for the fleeting expletive. The FCC says, given the core meaning of the F word, any use of that word or a variation in any context inherently has a sexual connotation. I've called this the FCC's connotations hypothesis, and it opens the gate to connecting with the Radio Act and subsequent legislation. But is this hypothesis true? It might come as a surprise to, for example, Bono, who is surely just using the F word as an emphatic marker in his own fleeting expletive from 2003. But let's see whether we can evaluate the hypothesis more fully using the toolkit that we've developed for ourselves throughout this quarter.